if it's the 35 year old self they've got to be, remember that decisions that they make today is going to affect the 65 and the 75 year old self as well have you ever wondered about how we make decisions about our money or why we feel the way we do about those decisions welcome to nudging financial behavior the podcast that aims to help you understand how and why you make certain decisions about money. Presented by Dr. Giselle Willows, an expert in behavioral finance. This podcast is all about looking at human behavior and biases, especially when it comes to your finances. You can catch the series on YouTube, the Nudging Financial Behavior blog, or on your favorite podcast platform. Be sure to like and subscribe to ensure you don't miss an episode. Special thanks to our sponsor, IG Market South Africa, a world-leading online trading provider that gives you access to opportunities across thousands of financial markets through their intuitive platforms and apps. Let's get started. Welcome to episode four of Nudging Financial Behavior. I'm Dr. Giselle Willows, welcoming you back. In this series, it's my goal to help you recognize the biases that can subtly and sometimes not so subtly, pull or push your thinking into making decisions about your finances that aren't entirely rational. When you're able to recognize these pushes and pulls, you'll be able to make smarter choices about your money and hopefully end up saving and earning more. In this episode, we're going to be continuing our discussion on the most common pitfalls that get us into financial trouble. I also speak to Dirk Krunewald, a certified financial planner, about how he goes about getting to grips with the client's investing style as well as setting up a saving plan for a client. Please like this episode, and if you haven't done so yet, subscribe to our channel. Let's quickly recap pitfalls one to four. Remember, we need to have an awareness of these pitfalls before we get into the nitty gritty of behavioral biases. We started with financial illiteracy and the scarily low number of adults in South Africa who know what terms like inflation and compound interest actually mean. What's more, this lack of understanding can be seen across the entire spectrum of education and household income levels throughout the country. The three most basic terms you need to understand are inflation, compound interest, and the time value of money. Once you've got to grip with these three, you can start to understand the long-term impact of the financial decisions that you make today. Next up, we looked at overconsumption or lifestyle creep. This is where you start to spend more on non-essential items or luxuries. The more you spend on non-essentials, the less you have to put into savings or to spend on essential items. It's a strange thing that the more we earn, suddenly the more we need. Thirdly, we covered being debt burdened. It's scary how easy it is to get into debt these days and how completely overwhelming that can be if you don't have a handle on your spend for non-essential items. Around 70 to 80% of disposable income in South Africa goes to debt. Most important thing I can say here is that you need to make sure you understand the type of debt you have, that you can afford it, and that you steer clear of dodgy debt with very high interest rates. Finally, in the previous episode, we talked about having insufficient savings. This is usually the double whammy combination of lifestyle creep and having too much debt. Most people don't even realize that they don't have enough savings to cover their essential expenses until it's too late. I know. It sounds like it's all doom and gloom, but it's not. We're here to try and help nudge you into better financial decisions. And yes, that is exactly why this podcast and my company are called Nudging Financial Behavior. If you start changing your money habits now, you can start to save far more efficiently. Okay, enough of my soapbox. Let's get into the rest of the list of pitfalls. Today, we need to talk about irrational behavior as a whole, risk aversion, lack of motivation, and poor planning. We've already spoken a bit about irrational behavior and decision-making thanks to the biases we discussed in episode one. So for this pitfall, irrational behavior, we're referring back to that. And these biases are pretty much what the rest of the season is going to be diving into. There's a lot to it. For now, let's just look at the emotional reactions that can have a major impact on our financial decision-making. These tend to be overconfidence, fear, and greed. When these come into play, it's very easy to make poor choices that result in financial losses or problems. 
all of these irrational behaviors are very normal reactions and emotions for human beings, and you shouldn't beat yourself up about having them. What I'd like to suggest, though, is that you take time before making important financial decisions to stop and consider whether you're making a snap decision, or if you've properly interrogated the facts before you make a move. It's so easy to move your investments because of fear due to a downturn in the markets rather than looking at the facts and figures in front of you and making a rational choice. Okay, there's going to be a lot more of this in the next episode, and the one after that, and the one after that. So let's move on for now. I'd like to talk about pitfall number six, risk aversion. Risk is something that you'll hear a lot about when it comes to investing. Most financial planners will immediately get you to fill out a risk assessment questionnaire, either before you even meet them or right at the beginning of your first meeting. What they're looking for is how well you can handle risk, because this will play a big part in your investment decisions. The risk you can handle will influence what assets you can invest in, and that will influence what returns you'll be able to earn and ultimately your lifestyle. We're all risk averse to some degree. It's no fun exposing yourself to potential loss even if the potential for gains in the longer term are high. But some people can handle more risk than others. Often, that enables them to make more money through riskier investments. Risk tolerance is a personal thing and is usually influenced by socioeconomic factors for that individual, as well as things like age, gender, marital status, and personality type. For example, the older you get, the lower your risk tolerance becomes because you have less time to wait out your investment and see long-term benefits. When you're married with dependents, you tend to be more circumspect with your money and your investments because you know that there are people who depend on you, unlike someone who is single and has no children. Personality type is another big one. Those with higher self-esteem are often willing to take on more risk and maybe borderline overconfidence on top of that. But people with higher self-esteem can also deal far better with anxiety that comes with watching their investments rise and fall. As always, it comes down to managing those emotions of ours. Emotions will prevent us from seeing long-term benefits because we're afraid of seeing a loss in the shorter term. Of course, your financial capacity will also play a big role. The more money you have, naturally, the easier it's going to be for you to take on risk. So, as you can see, while your ability to handle risk is essential to generate wealth, there are so many little things that limit our ability to handle that risk. Often, the best way to go about it is to rather flip it around and say, what lifestyle do you want to have? What returns do you need to earn to live that lifestyle? What assets do you then need to invest into to earn those returns? Finally, what associated risk is then required from you? Let's quickly chat to Dirk Krunewald, a certified financial planner at Client Care, where they are all about lifestyle financial planning. To hear how he goes about getting clients to think about that end goal first. Hi, Dirk. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, Giselle. Thanks for having me on. I'm busy chatting to my listeners briefly about risk aversion, and I've just told them how it can often be more useful to think about your end goal rather than how much risk you can handle. Can you explain to us a little bit about how you get your clients to think that way? We, we do a lot of, um, of client education when, when we bring a client on board, so we focus very much on helping them understand, um, so, so risk itself is a dirty word, um, you know, risk in the markets. We, we, we prefer to talk about volatility, um, you know, so temporary, temporary lows and permanent highs. Um, so yeah, we, we, we try and get them to understand that, that real investing is actually a long-term gain, uh, game and gain. Um, and, um, and, and that, you know, we, we, we help them understand that there is going to be short-term volatility. Um, and again, instead of talking about high risk or low risk portfolios, we, we rather speak about high return or low return portfolios. So we, we try and get our clients to understand that volatility is something that they really need to embrace. Uh, that is something that is going to happen, um, but they need that to be able to get the gains they need to be able to achieve their, their, their long term goals. Do you find that, you know, that education and explaining that to them actually helps them be more tolerant of risk or volatility, as you described it? We do, because, you know, especially when we, we, we what we do is we'll first show them how the normal process they would go through, which would be to fill out a, a risk form and then how that would categorize them into low, medium or high risk based on how they answered some questions or based on their age. Um, and that, that, that then 
how they feel on that particular day or how they get boxed uh, can determine the outcomes for the rest of their life and how that just that just doesn't match up with what they really need. So so once we show them that they a lot of them have been through that process so they can relate to it, and then when we, we explain, you know, uh, that we actually start with lifestyle. So, you know, uh, wealth is relative to different people. Um, and, a, and a great lifestyle, again, is relevant to, to what people want out of life. So what they, what they do like is the fact that we focus very much on them, uh, who they are, why they're unique, and, and what, what, the, what they want to achieve with their families and their lives. Brilliant. Thanks, Dirk. But don't leave us just yet. I want to chat to you again a little later in this episode. One thing that I thought was really interesting there was how you don't want to get put inside a box that sets your risk tolerance at one level. Things are always changing and our ability to handle more volatility, as Dirk put it, will change too. Right, we've got two more pitfalls to discuss. Number seven on the list is another one that comes from the very human quality of not always being able to follow through on good intentions. It's the lack of motivation. So many of us, myself included, struggle with a lack of self-control and can be very good at procrastinating. Think of all those New Year's resolutions that you haven't followed through on yet. Each year, we promise ourselves that we'll be better, we'll exercise regularly, we'll make time for our hobbies, we'll stop smoking, just pick your vice. And unfortunately, very few of us stick to those resolutions. Temptation is everywhere. And besides, you only live once, right? Yellow. True, you do only live once. But don't you want to be able to afford to live well throughout your life? The problem with procrastinating with saving and spending behavior is that the later you change, the less you gain. Remember what I said in the previous episode about the sunscreen example? Waiting until you're getting ready to retire is going to make it a lot harder. You need to do the work long before the sun damage begins to show. But please... Those of you who are listening or watching who might be a little late on in life, this doesn't mean it's too late for you. It's never too late to start. If you're lacking the motivation to save now, and it doesn't have to be a lot, even the smallest amount can make a difference, you need to find the most tempting carrot you can and dangle it in front of your nose every day. This is a lot easier for short-term saving goals. Print out a picture of that holiday destination you're saving for and stick it on the wall so you see it every day. Maybe it's a great jacket or a new computer. These all make for great motivation. But what about long-term saving goals? This carrot needs to be a summation of what you're dreaming your financial future is going to look like. Maybe it's being able to buy a camper van and road trip whenever and wherever once you retire. Maybe it's being able to send your kids to university. The thing with this is that you need to remind yourself of your future financial goals. When we don't do that, we get too easily caught up in the smaller and less important things we think we want today. I'm not saying it's easy. Having the self-control to say no to instant gratification is really difficult. It takes decisive action and constant reminders of what that end goal is. You have to keep choosing your financial future over getting the latest gadget or newest fashions. Over time, These changes will become easier because you'll have broken the habit of always going for that instant gratification. But you're going to have to keep dangling that carrot. Finally, we're on our last pitfall, poor planning. You know what they say, failing to plan is planning to fail. If you don't have a plan to reach your savings goal, you're just putting money away without any idea of whether or not it's enough or when you're going to even reach your goal. I did a study a couple of years ago that showed that most people do not have a plan for how they're going to reach their savings goal. And for those that do, most do not stick to it. In fact, only 17% of respondents were able to stick to their retirement plans. This is not ideal. You cannot go month to month and expect your financial situation to change. You need to plan to make that change. This means creating a budget, working out how much your goal actually is and how much you need to save monthly in order to reach it when you want to reach it. Don't think full-blown retirement plan yet. I'm talking about a plan to save for that holiday at the end of the year. Plan to pay off that debt. Start small. What I like about this final pitfall we're discussing here is that it's actually the most promising one because it's the one that is easily targeted. And if done correctly, it can create a positive knock-on effect for all the other pitfalls. 
I'm sure Dirk Krunewald is going to agree with me. Thank you for staying with us, Dirk. Sure, I'm here. When it comes to helping your clients plan for their financial futures, what key questions do you ask your clients to think about? So what we try and do is understand uh, their, their previous experience um, with investing or also their relationship to money. So we, you know, we'll, we'll ask a question like, what is your first memory of money? Or, or, or how was money growing up? And it sounds quite odd, but, uh, but it's quite amazing what people come up with. Um, and we, we know that the way people grow up around money um, has a real effect on, on how they feel about, about it later on in their lives and about markets and all that. So if they've had a traumatic experience or, or seen that happen to maybe their parents, you know, they could be really put off by, by investing in the market, for instance. Um, yeah. Yes, that, that thing you touch on there is that financial socialization, which is such a topical thing at the moment. It's all about how you were raised and your previous experiences around money, how that completely influences the way you see your financial future. Yeah, and sometimes you'll, you'll often find that, you know, people think that their situation is hopeless. So they're just going to do nothing about it because, you know, they, they think they're in this big hole. So you spoke about, uh, you know, long-term planning and, and then also your, your shorter-term goals because to speak to a younger person about retirement, you, you're going to lose them pretty quickly. Uh, this new generation. Um, and, and then older people you might lose simply because they don't believe they ever are going to be able to retire. So I think it's important to find a balance between living life now and providing for the later self as well. So if it's the 35-year-old self, they've got to be, remember that decisions that they make today is going to affect the 65 and the 75-year-old self as well. So we, we try and help clients understand the balance. So not all on the one side or all on the other side. Living all for today is also going to get you into trouble later on. So it, it really is about balance and helping clients understand that it's everything, every little thing that they do does count and it can make a difference. Absolutely. I do agree. It's all about that balance. So if you're able to help clients think about that balance and make the right decisions around saving for those goals, with your relationship going forward as their financial planner, how do you then help them stay on track with that, with all the surprises that life throws at you along the way? How do you help them stay on that course? Yeah, so I mean, we know, you know, uh, we plan, man plans and God laughs. Um, so, so what we do is we, we start with a really basic long-term plan, you know, because when we, if you start a relationship and I sit down with you and say, well, what are your goals? 99% of people are just going to stare off into the sunset or they're going to feel, well, actually, you know, I don't have any major goals. I'm a bit of a loser. So we start with the really basic stuff like, like when you think you would like to retire and, you know, everyone does a budget. So we, we need to understand the kind of finance they're going to need later on in their lives. And then as that relationship develops, we find that we're able to get a little bit more specific around, um, you know, a relationship isn't built up over a short time. But a real trusting relationship where, where people can go a little bit deeper very often happens over, over time. So by, you know, we, we, we structure our meetings annually as well, our reviews. We'll meet with clients at least twice a year. And every time we will we'll go back to the plan. Everything is about the plan, which is, is their plan. And as much as we plan moving forward, one thing we do know is that the plans are going to change because things will happen that you can't, that are expected, that are unexpected, that you can and you can't plan for. Um, and, and it's important for us that we build a relationship where, Clients understand that that when something's going wrong, they can pick up the phone and call us, come and see us, and we're going to help them through that, that transition or that situation. I love it. Thank you, Dirk. Please keep doing the good work that you're doing. It's really great to hear about how Dirk reviews plans with these clients twice a year. This has to go a long way towards ensuring that they stick to their plans and can really achieve their goals. It's not easy, but it can be done. We've reached the end of our pitfalls. It wasn't the easiest subject matter, I know. It's not easy to look at these eight and realize how we're all guilty of falling into these traps to some degree. But thank you so much for pushing through. You're not going to regret it. Like I've said before, just remember that you're not alone. This is typical human behavior. We're human, we have emotions, and we all struggle to manage those emotions when it comes to money. The beauty though, is that once you start recognizing these flaws, you can take control of them. So that's it for episode four of Nudging Financial Behavior. 
Please like this episode, and if you haven't done so yet, subscribe to our channel. In the next episode, we'll begin our discussion on the biases that impact our behavior and our ability to make rational decisions. Chat then. That was Nudging Financial Behavior, hosted by behavioral finance expert, Dr. Giselle Willows. Make sure you like and subscribe so that you don't miss an episode. You can catch the Nudging Financial Behavior podcast on YouTube, our blog, or your favorite podcast streaming platform. Thank you again to our sponsors, IG Market South Africa, for helping to bring the show to life. And now for the disclaimer. This podcast should not be seen as advice. All the information and opinions are of a general nature. They are not intended to address the needs or circumstances of any individual. We are not financial advisors, neither are any of our staff or service providers, nor is our sponsor. All expressions of opinion by the host or guest are subject to change without notice in reaction to shifting market conditions. Any information you get from us should be seen as only that. Information only.